Hello, and thank you very much for joining this latest ARC in the ARC series uh, of talks um, about what the spending review means for schools. Uh, it's been a really fascinating series. And just a reminder that this is a webinar, so you can't be seen or heard, but please do post questions in the chat. And if you've got any queries or problems, just post in the chat and we'll sort it out. Uh, so the subject we're talking about today is what does the spending review mean for schools? And the last time I chaired one of these meetings, in fact, one of the guests was Sir Kevin Collins, who'd just been appointed the government's education recovery commissioner. Um, and a lot has happened since then. He's produced his £15 billion plan, rescue plan. He's resigned because the Treasury rejected it. The Treasury has produced its budget and spending review and they spent more time on uh, alcohol duties than schools um, and that's not even mentioning cake and uh, being ambushed by cake and all the parties and everything that's been going on in politics so there's massive to uh, there's masses to talk about um, and I've also spent the last seven months going around the country visiting schools talking to people about education as chair of the Times Education Commission. Um, we have published our interim report today, which uh, we're going to post some links in the chat, uh, which is outside the paywall so everyone can read it for free. Uh, and what really uh, struck me is that although life's incredibly tough for schools at the moment with the pandemic, the Omicron variant um, just causing havoc, this is also, in a way, a real opportunity for schools that parents have, have seen really firsthand what an amazing job teachers and schools are doing. They've got, they're have got they more interested than ever in what and how their children are, lear are learning. Uh, and there is a sort of chance for a reset moment to rethink about what and how children learn. So I think what I'm really interested to know today from our speakers is Obviously money is important, but also does there need to be reform and how do those two interact? So uh, I'm now gonna ask the panel just to introduce themselves recent, briefly. Um, Luke, do you want to go first? Sure, um, my name's Luke Sibietta. Uh, I mean, I'm a research fellow at the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Education Policy Institute. Um, and I lead IFS's work on education and school spending. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, uh, I'm Jonathan Simons. I'm a partner and head of the education practice at Public First, a uh, public policy consultancy, uh, and I'm a former civil servant, um, including in the Treasury, and I had the joy of uh, overseeing uh, three spending reviews concerning education. Sam. Uh, thank you. I'm a senior advisor uh, here at ARC, and I'm also a senior fellow at the Institute for government, uh, working with them on education. Um, I only had to endure one uh, spending review, I think, uh, but that was bad enough. So, um, and I, but I was on, I, I was, I was in the Department for Education during it. So, uh, so felt the full brunt of the Treasury's force. Um, okay, I'm going to start with uh, Luke. Whether you could just set out for us what the figures tell us. So that there, uh, there was a to me, a really shocking figure that the IFS produced after the spending review, which showed that between 2010 and 25 and 2025, health spending would be will have increased by 42 percent, but education spending would have risen by less than three percent. That just says such a lot about the priorities in Whitehall uh, under this government. And I just wondered, Luke, could you just start by uh, setting out the landscape for us? Sure, of course. Uh, I'm going to speak to a, a few slides setting out um, uh, what's happened to what the spending review meant for schools and education more broadly. Um, and so just to give start with a brief overview um, of the key conclusions. So as, as Rachel has, has, has already highlighted, there were significant and large cuts to education spending over the last um, 10 years with an 8% real terms cut in total spending on education across the UK since 2010. Now, uh, that stands in sharp contrast to the experience of health spending, which has continued to increase over the last 10 years, though at a slower rate than it has done before. But if we look over a much longer time frame, we see that um, education and health spending both represented a similar share of national income in the early 90s, about four and a half percent. But since that 
since that point in time, house spending has continued to increase as a share of national income. It's now more like eight, nine percent. Um, but education spending, we, we still spend the same amount of our national income on on education. And that, that sort of trend over time partly reflects demographic shifts and the taste for more spending on healthcare, but it also reflects spending priorities of successive governments as well. Um, just focusing on school spending, we know that there were large cuts of school spending over the last 10 years. Those will be effectively reversed by the recent spending review, but we'll still be spending for people at the same level as it was in 2010, um, which was trumpeted as an achievement, but in actual reality is a bit of a low bar. The distribution of spending has also changed over the last year, over the last 10 years, with um, bigger cuts to spending at most deprived areas, um, which is clearly going to make it more difficult to level up poor areas of the country. There's also been, over the very long run, a shift to spending more at younger ages, which is in line with um, academic evidence, but um, that evidence also suggests that that needs to be um, followed up um, uh, over time throughout the system in order to be most effective. Now, as I said, when I was introducing myself, I lead IFS's work on education spending, and all the analysis I'll be mentioning um, is taken from our annual report on education spending and can be found on our dedicated website as well. Um, so just, just to start with the sort of nuts and bolts of the school funding settlement, we already knew that school spending was due to rise by about £7 billion between 2019 and 2022. The spending review added to that by providing, surprisingly, an extra amount of money for 2022, about £1.4 billion. And that's before we even consider the compensation for the health and social care levy, um, if it goes ahead, of course. Um, there's then going to be a further three billion rise in um, school funding between 2022 and 2024, which makes for a total rise of around four and a half billion pounds over the next three years. And that will be enough to effectively reverse the cuts in school spending that we've seen over the last 10 years, um, when there was a 9% real terms cut in spending per pupil. Um, to illustrate that on a, on a graph on the next slide, um, this shows the level of school spending per pupil relative to its level in 2009-10, um, after accounting for inflation. Over the 2000s, there was a relatively rapid increase in school spending per pupil, and it reached a high point in around 2009-2010. Over the next 10 years, there was a 9% real terms drop in spending per pupil, reaching a low point around 20, 20, 2019. Um, the extra money in the spending review we project will be enough to effectively reverse the cuts seen over the last 10 years, but we'll still leave spending for people about the same level as it was in 2010 by 2024. As I said, that's a bit of a low bar because 14 years of no overall growth in school spending is effectively without precedent, without precedent in post-war UK history. Um, Moving on to look at how that funding has been distributed, those cuts have been distributed over the last 10 years. Um, we know that, um, and just focusing on secondary schools as an example, we know there's been an average cut of 9% across secondary schools over the last 10 years, but that cut's been larger at around 14% for the most deprived set of uh, secondary schools over the last 10 years. Now, some of that is driven by uh, change in demographics and nature of deprivation across the country with deprivation more, uh, more likely to be located outside of London, where there was higher funding and higher, higher costs. Um, but it's also been driven by policy changes. So for example, the pupil premium not keeping pace with inflation over the last um, six years, or, fa or, or factors with the national funding formula that tended to prioritize schools in, in less deprived areas, such as minimum funding levels, and, and other factors in the way the government implemented the national funding formula. Moving on from schools to look at um, further education in sixth forms, which also has a very clear bearing on, on schools' budgets. Um, we already know there was due to be a £700 million increase um, in funding between, 2020, between 2019 and 2021. Um, the spending review added to that by providing an extra £1.6 billion, which included extra money for uh, T levels as well. Um, but because of the size of cuts to further education and sixth form funding over the last uh, 10 years, that won't be nearly enough to reverse some of the cuts that we've seen. So to illustrate that in the next slide, um, by way of a graph, this graph shows the level of spending per pupil in further education and sixth form colleges um, all the way back to 1990. Um, the school sixth form funding per pupil, we can only go back to around 2002, unfortunately. What we see for FE and colleges uh, and sixth form colleges is a big drop in, in spending a student over the 1990s, an increase over the 2000 and reaching a high point in 2010. 
Um, since after which there is about a drop of about 14-15% in college spending per student. The extra money in the spending review will be enough to reverse some of those cuts, but not nearly all enough, and spending per student will still be about 10% down from its most recent high point in 2010. The school sixth forms, the funding situation is even more, it is even worse. Um, it reached a high point around 2010 as well, after which there was about a 28% real terms drop in funding per student um, between 2010 and 2019. And I, I, um, some people often don't believe the, the, the scale of that cut because it's so large, but it's, it's, it, it really was a significant cut in sixth form funding per student. And the extra money won't be anywhere near enough to reverse some of the cuts, the, the, the size of those cuts, given the scale of them. Um, then to look at more broadly spending across all age groups, um, this graph shows the level of spending per student across the early years in um, sort of purpley colour. Um, primary schools in green, secondary schools in yellow, further education, sixth form colleges in orange, and higher education in blue. Um, and by and large, spending per student is higher for higher age group, and that partly reflects the higher cost of provision of higher age groups. But the gap between spending per student across different age groups um, has changed over time. Um, and so as I, it, as I illustrate on, on the next slide, um, the, in, if we go back to the 1990, early 1990s, spending per student in, in higher education um, was about four times the level of spending per student in, in primary schools, uh, College spending was around 250% of the level in, in primary schools. The secondary funding ratio was around 1.66 or 66% higher in secondary schools. And early years funding basically didn't exist in the early 1990s. We fast forward to 2020, we still see higher spending per student for older age groups, but the differences are much, much less. So higher education spending is only around 63% higher than primary school spending. The secondary primary ratio is only around 14%. There's almost no difference between FE college spending and primary school spending per student. And the early years has risen and, and grown a, 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 as, a, as a part of um, education spending. And so to conclude and, and summarize, um, as I said, there have been some significant and historically large cuts of education spending over the last 10 years. Some of that will be undone in the form of uh, cuts to school spending that will be mostly undone, but we'll, it's still gonna be a, a big squeeze on school budgets given there's been no, no overall growth since 2010. And as I'm, I'm sure you're all, all aware, the pressures and expectations on schools have not uh, uh, have been continually increasing over the years as well. Um, there's also been a change in distribution of funding that's going to make it harder to level up poorer areas of the country, with bigger cuts for more deprived schools and larger cuts for colleges, sixth forms, adult education, and technical education, which the government has been um, trying to emphasise as a priority. And lastly, there's been a long run shift to spending at younger ages. Um, and as I said at the start, there is strong evidence to suggest that um, early investments at younger ages are, 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 are very much a, a good idea and, and improve a long run outcomes. But to retrieve their full benefit, they need to be sustained over time. You can't just put all your eggs in the early years basket and hope for the best. Um, good, good quality early years investment needs to be followed up with good provision throughout school, college and university as well. Um, so that's where I'll stop with my uh, whistle stop tour of the, the spending review. And I think I'm now handing over to Jonathan, if I remember rightly. Yes, thanks so much, Luke. That's fascinating. I've got about a million questions I could ask you, but I'm going <laughs> to save them up. Um, Jonathan, do you want to give us an overview of the political landscape? So to what extent does the having a kind of vacuum in number 10 and a increasingly assertive treasury affect the spending choices that we saw at the uh, spending review, and particularly for education? Do you think somebody said to me that they thought Rishi Sunak just didn't get education at all at any level? What do you think about that? Uh, we've got a we've got a week number ten. Um, I mean, who knew? Uh, so so yes, I think. So let me let me give a sort of broader perspective on on what spending reviews are because they are on the one hand economic events. They are the way in which the government allocates hundreds of billions of pounds normally over a three-year period. They are one of the most significant things that a government can do, uh, and you normally only get one per parliament. So they are, they are very, very important economic events, but they're also deeply political events. And choices that governments make are partly driven by the figures, but they are, as, as, as Luke said, partly driven by 
uh, by priorities and those priorities can be political priorities and that that's not a bad thing governments are allowed to be political they don't stop being political just because they get elected and the sort of occasional dismissiveness as you get that says well i can't believe a government's made political choices it's like well i mean of course it has this is a this is a government that has historically been elected by on the whole older voters large proportion of retired voters who consume a vast amount of health resources it's not a coincidence uh, that health spending increases partly because as people get older the cost per treatment increases and you have to increase it just to keep standing still but also partly as a political choice and, and that's not a that's not a bad thing it's also not a coincidence that as luke uh, luke showed on his slides you know earlier spending rose particularly under uh, new labor who uh, when i was in government were very very concerned about uh, early years and there are good economic reasons for it but there are also good political reasons to do with who voted for, for for new labor so i suppose a spending review is is really about at least four things simultaneously so it's about the financial envelope it is about literally how much money there is available to spend and we can have an argument about what government could and should not borrow from but essentially there is a, there is a fixed budget we might disagree on exactly where the edges are, but there is a fixed amount of money that does need to be allocated out and a spending review is essentially about apportioning out that, uh, <laughs> I was about to say cake. Um, the second thing that a spending review is about is about treasury power. Uh, this is the single most powerful that a treasury can be when it allocates spending for the next three years. Uh, and that's really, really important. The third thing a spending review is about is about a fight between the prime minister and the chancellor. And there's no getting away from the fact that it is that it can be an amicable fight, um, but it is a fight because traditionally prime ministers want to spend more money and chancellors want to spend less money and who wins that and who loses that tells you a lot about where power is in Parliament at any one particular time. And the fourth thing that a spending review is about uh, is about an argument between Treasury and what are called the spending departments, the, the departments that spend the money um, and a Treasury uh, spending review is a series of bilateral conversations between the Treasury and sometimes, but not always, number 10, and the various spending departments. Uh, so what happens is that the spending departments say how much money they want for the next three years, uh, and the Treasury negotiates bilaterally with them and settles one at a time um, once they've come to an agreement. And sometimes that involves number 10, normally because the spending department has gone to number 10 to appeal its case, because always what happens is the Treasury offers much less uh, than the spending department wants. Uh, and so you have to come to some version of refereeing. Um, but that process is a technical process and it is a political process. And there's a lot of game playing that goes on in spending reviews, um, some of which is amusing, uh, some of which is darkly comic, uh, some of which is a complete waste of anyone's time. Um, but, it, it, but it happens. It's, it's, it's the type of throat clearing that needs to go on. So what always happens to start with is that the Treasury says there is no money and you all have to make massive cuts and spending departments say, OK, and they offer up a load of cuts which are patently ridiculous and could never be accepted. So, you know, the traditional thing that the Department for Education always used to say is like, well, fine, well, we'll just we'll just sack teachers. If we don't have any money, that's the cut we'll make on the grounds that the Treasury will go. Clearly, that's ridiculous. OK, you need more money. The Ministry of Defence always used to say, well, we won't fly the Red Arrows or we will we'll, we'll cut the Navy or we'll get to a stage where we can't defend the Falkland Islands anymore. Uh, these are sort of well-known tropes, but nevertheless, they still do get trotted out on occasion. So you go through that period where the Treasury is asking for cuts that are clearly ridiculous. Departments are offering up cuts which are clearly ridiculous um, and everyone sort of has a jolly good laugh about it before you actually get down to some serious negotiating. But eventually you do get to a stage where um, you have come to a series of bilateral agreements uh, between the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and then the Chancellor and the relevant Secretary of State. The reason why this spending review just gone was interesting was, I think, for a number of reasons. The first of which was there was a, a reshuffle just beforehand. Now, if you are a policy wonk, um, it's a silly, silly decision. It's very silly to have a reshuffle just before a spending review because putting together a spending review takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of the Secretary of State's personal attention. It's a process of many, many months because within the Department for Education or whoever else, you are equally filtering up bids that come in from all other bits of the department. So the Director General for Schools will want all the DfE money to go to schools, the Director General for Early Years will want more money for Early Years and so on and so forth. And even within that, every single team wants a bit more money and wants a bit more process so you have to go through a lot of prioritization to get to the letter that you ultimately write to the treasury with 
the Department for Education's bid. And that takes a lot of time and you have to go to and from ministers an awful lot of time. You have to go to and from special advisors. You have lots and lots of discussions about what your priorities are. Now, all of that was completely wiped out because Gavin Williamson was overseeing the spending review submission until he wasn't. And Nadim Zahawi was parachuted in, in common with much of the rest of the cabinet with, I mean, let's be clear, absolutely zero understanding of what was in the departmental submission. Because these are very long, very technical documents. They use words like baseline and end year flexibility and near cash and non cash. They're very, very technical documents to do with the way in which public finances are accounted for. And no matter how smart you are as a new secretary of state, with the best one in the world, you have almost no idea what's in your document beyond the very, very top level priorities. So Nadim Zahari would have been essentially presented with this document that says, here is our negotiation document with the Treasury. We're, we're almost done. We're almost there. You just have to kind of finish it off. And he'll say, can I change anything? And they say, uh, no, not really. Um, so it is very difficult. And the fact that there was a reshuffle was essentially a power play by the Treasury because it made it very, very hard for any spending department to push at the last minute. Because if you are a new Secretary of State, you don't want to irritate the Chancellor. You don't want to irritate the Prime Minister who's just given you a new job. And you don't have a huge uh, back amount of expertise in order to draw from. You can't stand up as Nadim Zahawi and say, look, I've been making this argument for six months. I've done all the research. I've worked it through with my officials. We need to have additional money for, let's say, catch up. And this amount you are offering is simply not enough. He was not in a position to make that argument. So that's why it was in a, a, an important spending review. The second reason why it was important is because it was really, really thin, by which I mean the document itself was thin. Now, this was a real surprise to people, including me, who've been watching government for the last few years, because, of course, the spending review had been delayed already. It was meant to be in last year and, and potentially even the year before that. And it had been delayed for understandable reasons because of COVID. But what that meant was is that government had had two more years to get their act together. Departments which normally have six months to think about this thing had had two and a half years to think about this thing. Now, granted, a lot of them were busy with COVID. But it is not implausible that departments would have taken the extra time to really think quite hard about what the future structure of the state looks like, what additional spending might be used on, what additional reform programmes might be on. But there was none of that in the document. And essentially what happened is that, uh, to, to, to Rachel's point, uh, Rishi Sunak took fright and uh, was not prepared either for economic or political reasons to make big decisions. So normally, if you go back and look at Gordon Brown's spending reviews and the ones I were involved in, they were huge, long, great big documents. The document that the Treasury puts out sets out in exhaustive detail exactly what every single department is going to get for its money. It was very, very thin this time. You know, there was very, very high level commitments to a bit more on school spending, some more stuff on skills, a little bit of stuff on catch up, a few other bits on higher education. But a lot of it was just deferred or wasn't even explained. It was actually quite hard to unpick the totality of what the Department for Education had been given. And that is because it was a political uh, budget and a political spending review. And Sam's going to come on to talk a little bit more about what the politics are. But I think the last observation I would make is I don't think it is so much that Rishi Sunak doesn't understand education or prioritise education, but for at least the last two years, he has been motivated principally by two things. One is he is an absolute textbook low tax fiscal hawk conservative chancellor of the exchequer uh, and he has found a treasury that is also an incredibly orthodox low tax low spending department that is traditionally the role of the treasury and the two of them have fitted hand in glove and he has become more and more cautious about spending additional money and it is worth noting in his defense that as the state we have spent around 300 billion pounds just on covid response now that is probably very sensible and we'd have been a lot worse off had we not done but an element of that money does need to be paid back again some of it is funded well almost all of it's funded by borrowing you can debate how long you want to run your borrowing for but we have spent a vast amount of additional money and Rishi Sunak is acutely conscious of that and doesn't want to set a permanently higher baseline of recurrent public spending and the second thing which motivates him and drives him is that he would like to be the next prime minister of this country and he is not uh, naive enough to make what are called politically courageous decisions until he has really talked them through. And you see that most often and most effectively in the education space uh, in tuition fees, where we have been promised for almost two years now a final decision on tuition fees. Will they be cut? Will there be fewer young people going to university? 
will graduates have to pay back more? And the uh, suggestion was that in the spending review, they would make that final announcement. And essentially, uh, so it is believed, Rishi Sunak took fright, uh, was not prepared to essentially clobber 20 something graduates and their parents with additional repayment rates, and once again, kicked it into the long grass. So we've got a spending review, it was thin, it was political, it was a power play that overruled on the whole a new cabinet, uh, and a lot now, uh, as ever, comes down to the whim of an imperial treasury and how it will continue to push spending over the next few years. And I'll stop there. Fascinating, thank you. Sam, um, I'm so interested to hear what you think about the treasury and whether, I mean, the treasury argument is that education you know, the departments are shroud waving, they don't really need all this money. Kevin Collins was just asking for far too much. Uh, I'm told that Kevin Collins was told by Downing Street just sort of a days before he resigned that 10 billion was in the bag that was absolutely approved even by the Treasury. And then at the very last minute, Rishi Sunak overruled the uh, Downing Street. Um, and that even in the run up to the spending review, Gavin Williamson didn't put in a bid for education, that they were arguing, you know, education didn't really need any more money. So Sam, do you think education does need more money? Uh, does the Treasury have a point that actually it should use the money it's got better and be more efficient? What's your assessment on, on the sort of politics and the reality of that? Um, so I think, well, I think Kev Kevin Collins, who I'm a big fan of, made one, uh, one big mistake, which was to trust uh, the prime minister. Um, and uh, he, he should have spent, and I mean that seriously, in that he should have spent more time convincing the treasury uh, and been less sure that having number 10's backing would mean he'd get his money. The treasury were, were not impressed by, by what, he, what he gave them. And I have some sympathy with their position, to be honest, because I think the argument for more time, uh, which is what he wanted to spend most of the money on, is there, but it's not super strong. Uh, and I don't think uh, the, the argument was presented uh, strongly enough. And I think actually there were better things that he could have he could have asked for money for. But but sort of to, to your question of um, uh, did, should, should we be giving more money to schools? I'm gonna give a, a, a sort of counterintuitive answer and then explain why no, I don't think they should have given more money to schools, but uh, I do think they should have put more money elsewhere in the system to help schools. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So um, uh, when you look at uh, sort of the charts that Luke showed us at the beginning of the, uh, 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 of the call, uh, you might think, oh, 7 billion more for schools. That's a lot. And then, then on top of that, they've given another sort of 1 billion, 1.5 billion for next year. And there's more the following year. It's actually pretty generous. If you look at sort of, you know, by 2025, we'll be pretty much where we were and 2010, yes, it's not an increase, but it's not a cut. You know, uh, org organizations should be able to get more efficient over 15 years. Yes, the health service has had far more money, but the health service needs a lot more money. People are getting older. We've just had a massive pandemic. Now, you can make an argument that the school's budget is actually pretty generous. The problem is uh, it, that there are cuts elsewhere in the spending review and over the last decade that have put huge additional funding pressure on schools. And that's where I think the problem is. Um, so, um, and I think this comes in sort of two forms. One is direct cuts, one is not dealing with demand. Uh, so to look at the, at the direct cuts, one is to local government. Local government has been cut by far more than any other part of, uh, of government. Um, uh, and uh, we're talking to 40% cuts over the last decade, very substantial. And what's that, what that has meant is that they have effectively had to significantly reduce spending money on anything that isn't a statutory duty, anything they don't have to do by law. Uh, things like adult social care, which they have to do. Um, and that has meant lots of cuts to discretionary services, things like libraries, things like support services for parents, um, things like uh, clubs and activities for young people. All of that has been cut away uh, to some degree, pretty much in every local authority, some worse than others. Um, and the net effect of that is that schools then have to pick up, either have to pick up doing that activity themselves and take it on, uh, uh, at, at, at expense to them and obviously staff time, which is the most uh, costly thing to schools, or they don't and they take the results of, of young people and families not having those support services in place anymore, which means uh, 
and all the benefits that you get from those services don't apply. So uh, children have more family issues, uh, they have fewer or less access to books outside school, whatever it is, all of those things add up into, into problems for, for schools. The second and I think bigger uh, cuts issue is the um, cuts to welfare benefits that came in in 2016, but are only really starting to bite now. Um, and in particular, the benefits freeze, which means no family can get benefits above £26,000. Uh, and the, uh, the, the two child rule, which means you can't get any child benefit above uh, if you have more than two children. Uh, these are these are uh, uh, only really starting to bite now because they've been frozen, the £26,000 has been frozen uh, and the two child benefit uh, issue was only for people who had children after the announcement was made uh, and they are uh, and we can see you know year by year they are putting hundreds of thousands more children into poverty it is a direct effect of these policies that hundreds of thousands of children are going into poverty and the effect of that is that they are less that their, their, their families have less money they are less well suited to learn they have less space they have less access to technology they're less well fed uh, and all of the problems associated with poverty, we know the strongest evidence you can have in education that, that poverty leads to, leads to uh, worse academic outcomes. Um, and, uh, and we are putting more children into poverty. So again, schools have to deal with the, deal with the effect of that happening um, and having hungrier children in school, having children with uh, family problems caused by absence of money, et cetera. Uh, again, that puts huge pressure on, on schools. Then you have a bunch of issues that are related to demand, uh, where, where there hasn't been a cut in spending, but we've seen a, a huge increase in demand that hasn't been met by, by an increase in spending. So uh, mental health is an is a obvious issue here. Massive increases over the last decade, particularly the last few years, in referrals to children and adolescent mental health service. They did get some more money in the last parliament, nowhere near enough. The service is completely overrun. You've got young people waiting over well over a year for uh, referrals, referrals getting rejected even for very serious issues uh, like regular self-harm or, or, or um, uh, thinking about suicide. Um, and again, it's schools that have to pick that up um, because, uh, because no one else is going to. Um, and you have untrained staff having to deal with the sort of emotional problems that young people have that is not getting picked up by by, by, by medical professionals anymore. Um, same problem with special educational needs and disabilities. There you have had substantial budget increases uh, year on year, but it still hasn't kept up with the very substantial demand. We've seen an almost doubling over the last uh, eight years of um, young people on uh, education healthcare plans. Um, and, uh, and that is with very suppressed demand. So there are a lot of young people who, who whose parents or school wants those plans who aren't getting it because local authorities simply can't afford it. Um, and again, the fact that demand is not being fully met falls on schools uh, who uh, have to uh, support young people who perhaps in the past would have got uh, funding but are now not getting funding. Um, same pattern again with child protection, big increase in the number of, of, of young people with child protection plans. Um, Again, almost certainly suppressed demand. There's been um, a lot more assessments for child protection. The increase for assessments of child protection has gone up much higher than the actual number of plans, which again implies strongly suppressed demand. Again, the, the, the impact of that falls on schools who have to pick up these cases. All of this, uh, all of the things that I'm talking about hit the, the most disadvantaged schools the hardest. In every case, they are going to have more instances of the things that I've been talking about, whether it's poverty, mental health issues, special educational needs issues. Um, and they are also the ones, as per what Luke was saying, who've been hit the hardest uh, by cuts over the last few years. So going back right back to your original question, and I want to make sure we leave um, space for people to ask questions to, to the whole panel. Um, uh, if I had had a magic wand and been in control of the Treasury during the spending review, I would have put any spare money I could find into solving those problems, into uh, uh, building back up local government uh, uh, resources, into um, uh, getting rid of these incredibly unfair, cruel benefits caps, uh, and so on. That would then have had a very positive impact on schools, I think, uh, possibly more than just giving more money directly to schools.
That's so interesting. I think one of the things that shocked me most actually going around schools for the Education Commission is going to schools where they have washing machines because families don't have any washing machines, where they're giving furniture to families, you know, where they're having to use the school kitchen to send home food from the evening. Uh, and I think a lot of people, will, you know, will be really shocked to hear about that. But it's happening in, in way too many schools. They're, they're basically become social hubs haven't they and networks uh, in an extraordinarily impressive way but it's putting huge pressure more pressure on the schools um look i wanted to ask you and, and please do post questions in the chat um and i'll um read through the chat and ask the questions um look i'm wondering one thing that really strikes me is whether it's possible for the treasury to think in sufficiently long term uh way uh because of this three-year spending round um so John Major said to us on the commission that he thought the Treasury should think of um, education spending as a capital investment, if you like, an investment in human capital rather than day to day spending. Do you think the Treasury properly understands the sort of long term nature of education spending and actually all these other things, welfare spending um, and the sort of surrounding spending decisions? Is it possible under the current way in which the budgets are defined? So um, I think that's an excellent question and is uh, similar to one I was going to sort of pass over to some extent to Sam and Jonathan. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll firstly give my, my attempt at answer. Firstly, I, I think the Treasury does understand the long term benefits of education and the effects it has on the economy and earnings later on in life. Um, but they face the same constraints um, and politics day in, day out in terms of what gets measured in the deficit, what gets measured in borrowing. Um, and they will also see themselves as the guardians of the public finances because no one else is really looking out for the taxpayer in their minds. Um, so so it's, it's partly their job too. And I, and I think that, that there's a, 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 an important role there. Um, but the, the kind of issues I've been concerned about are, are ones that kind of Jonathan and Sam were raising as part as part of the, the, the very helpful contributions as well, which is is, is kind of that does the Treasury and do, why doesn't the Treasury respond to evidence around how spending is linked across different areas? I don't want to say well, why doesn't the Treasury understand because I'm sure the Treasury does understand the way that different areas of public spending are linked together. But why doesn't it respond to that sort of evidence? Um, and is it linked to the fact that it just has to consider short term public finances because of the way the public finance targets are measured? So so I don't want to use the example of school time, because I think you can always have an argument about whether extra time in school was, was, was well evidenced or not. But why is it that when there's a fairly decent evidence base for something, the Treasury sometimes won't act? What needs to be what needs to be there with the evidence or complemented with the evidence in order to ensure that it actually changes policy and choices and also there's a sort of economic boost from doing that so we had an analysis done by oxera for the education commission which found that the just bringing social mobility up to the western european average would um, generate 45 billion pounds uh, and there was a separate analysis which found that um, having children children or young people better prepared for work would boost corporate profits by 125 billion. So there's a very clear treasury argument for investment. Um, Jonathan, do you think, um, why do you think the treasury doesn't understand that to Luke's point? Or, or do you think the education system has been to blame because it's it's seen in the treasury's eyes as resisting reform and it hasn't been coming up with enough ideas, reforming ideas? So I think there's there's at least three <laughs> at least three answers to this, and it, it is it is one of the the big questions. And um, so I think the first thing is Luke is right to say that it's not about the Treasury understanding it. The Treasury is not stupid. It is full of very very smart people, um, and and uh, understands fully the aggregate economic argument that says if you invest in human capital, you will have a productivity payoff later down the road. The difficulty is that every single person makes a case that every single intervention is essentially about boosting, boosting capital and productivity and will lead to economic growth down the road. And whilst that is true in the aggregate, it is not indisputably true of every single intervention. And you end up in this sort of stasis where someone says, well, look, if you invested money in additional school time or in school meals or in, yeah, I mean, you name it, 
that will make people more productive. It'll mean that they earn more in tax receipts and it pays back. And the difficulty is you just don't know if that is true. And uh, the Treasury has been badly burned by, uh, if I'm mixing my metaphors now, drinking the Kool-Aid on a lot of this stuff, which has yet to really come through. So early years is a really good example. All of the academic evidence says that in the aggregate, high quality preschool education leads to uh, happier children and lower criminality and all sorts of things which have a direct cost benefit and leads to people being more productive and, and higher. And, and, you know, that was the argument as to why New Labour poured, you know, tens of billions of pounds into this. Um, the honest truth is that it doesn't always work as simply as that. It's not a linear model in and out. And, you know, at least some of the evidence suggests that a decent chunk of the money that was invested in things that like Sure Start haven't yet led to that productivity increase. Now, again, we can debate this ad nauseum, but it's not as simple as saying, put the money in, you'll get a return later on. And I think the second reason why it's difficult is um, that they are driven by three-year time spans, four-year time spans, five-year time spans. There are ways of getting around that, but it's difficult. And they're also driven by departmental boundaries. So every single spending agreement, like I remember when I was there, you know, Treasury is always quite attracted to models of shared budgets or area-based approaches or something that says, well, look, why can't you have health and police and local government and schools all work together to improve young people? And, and the difficulty is, is that you have to draw a boundary somewhere and you have to account for that money somewhere and you have to make sure that the money is spent effectively somewhere. And no matter how much you try and bring all of these things together, at some point you come up against hard edges and rough edges and that makes it quite hard to manage from a public accounting point of view. So it is not that people don't want this to happen and there's various different ways that have been tried to do it, but as yet we've never really successfully managed to get away from the fact that ultimately you get tax money in every year, you spend it every year, the difference is made up for by borrowing unless you're running a surplus and you have a duty to account for that and you can't just spend all the extra money on the grounds that it might work. Okay, um, I've got a question here from Ken Bromfield who says, I'm listening to a commentary about the flow of money in education, but as yet output, that is measuring the value of education to our young people involved in the transition to the workforce or the economy, and that there are huge skills gaps in the UK. And he also says that he's concerned about the relevance of our exam obsessed school curriculum, where young people tramp through as many GCSEs as possible. Um, this is certainly something that's come up a lot in the Education Commission that employers are saying they really don't feel that young people are ready for work and that they feel that the education systems focusing on the wrong things. Sam, do you want to address this? How much do you think um, the system isn't producing that productivity, perhaps because it, it's focusing on the wrong things, too much knowledge, not enough skills or whatever the you know, current ideological gap is? I'm a big fan of children trudging through lots of tests. I think it's uh, um, it's actually uh, a really important part of any good education system that you have a uh, external a sort of good external assessment across a core academic curriculum uh, at the end of what most countries would call junior high school. Um, I think if you don't do that, uh, as we it was the case in this country before we had GCSEs, you get huge unfairness in the system straight off the bat. Um, you will get children from wealthy families will do a core academic curriculum, will get all the benefits associated with that uh, economically and uh, civically, uh, and children from poorer backgrounds are less likely to do that and will not. Um, so I think if we want a fair society, you have to have an academic core curriculum that everyone is tested on um, in the way that we do. I don't think GCSEs are perfect. We could spend hours, I'm sure, talking about the ways in which they're not perfect, but you have to have something there. Um, uh, and they are testing skills. Algebra is a skill. Like the the like this knowledge skills thing is is just there. It is a it is a meaningless. Uh, there is, I, I think a lot of people when they talk about skills are actually talking about things that aren't skills. Things like creativity and teamwork, which are concepts but not skills, um, and uh, uh, and are very hard to sort of put into a curriculum. But that's a, again a much longer discussion. The only for the final point I'll make is that I do think post sixteen education is a much stronger case for um, uh, looking at reform. And obviously, there are reforms going on with the introduction of T levels. We're going to have a session at the next ARC talks, which is very focused on post sixteen qualification reform. Um, so I'd encourage people who are interested in the topic to come to that, and we'll talk more about that that there because I think there is there is a real issue post sixteen. Okay. Um... Oh, hold on. Um, 
Luke, this is a question from Helen Bush. To what extent does the DfE understand the impact of the factors which Sam set out on education outcomes? And are they making the case to the Treasury and other spending departments to address them? Luke, uh, do, you, do you have a view about that? Do you, you know, the, the sort of um, wider social factors? Well, I, I think to, to, to paraphrase, or to Jonathan's uh, and then Sam have kind of already both alluded to, and that th they, I'm sure they understand it, and we've been making the case along those lines as well. It's just how it then plays out through the interdepartmental politics of a spending review, um, and I think uh, I think Sam is is very right to bring up the issue of, of welfare spending and how it links to education spending needs um, and pressures um, because. Um, uh, 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 EPI's um, most recent annual report, which is I think about eighteen months old now, because of, because of lack of exams, uh, um, that showed the the role that persistent deprivation and persistent disadvantage is playing in driving the attainment gap over time. Um, so the there there would have been a fall in the the um, disadvantage gap um, up to twenty nineteen if there hadn't been this rise in persistent disadvantage. Uh, over time, and there are more and more families um, in schools who, who are sort of classed as persistently disadvantaged um, or facing very um, high and sort of, uh, well, high levels of, uh, of poverty, and that puts, puts pressure on schools. So I don't, I don't think it's, and I'm sure the department does understand that, they, they very much understand it. It's just how it plays out with inter, interdepartmental politics. Um, there's a question from Alan Lehman. Jonathan, do you want to take this one? Um, can the panel suggest a better way of deciding teacher pay? And I just add to that, to what extent do you think pay is the critical factor for teachers in terms of retention and recruitment? Um, I've been really interested the extent to which actually time seems almost more important to a lot of the teachers that we've talked to and the sort of pressures of work rather than actually pay. People aren't becoming teachers for the money. What do you think about the, both, both of those points? Well, I, I mean, at least some teachers demonstrably do become teachers for money um, because you see a very, very clear correlation between the relative attractiveness of a starting salary in teaching and the number of applicants going in. And you see it over the last 50 years, every time you've had a recession and private sector wage growth has decreased, teaching becomes more attractive. And we saw it during the pandemic and we saw it during the 2008-9 financial crisis. So uh, you also see it with teaching bursaries as well. NFER has done some brilliant work that shows pretty clearly when you raise teaching bursaries, more people go into teacher training um, because teachers are not are not dissimilar to any other economically rational human being, as in they need to have enough money to you know pay pay their living costs. You're absolutely right though that it's not just about pay, and there are lots of other factors, including workload that that, that work as a, a retention bar. And again, I think it's NFER work that shows that uh, something like half of all teachers that leave teaching go to become teaching assistants uh, or go to become kind of slightly more junior teachers uh, and they are essentially trading off uh, lower pay for lower workload so um, it's absolutely not just a kind of straight up pay question. And how it sorry I interrupted uh, Alan's question what do you how would you um, decide teacher pay do you think there's a better way? I mean <laughs> I mean in, in a sense Teacher pay is, is, is driven by the fact that we have an overall shortage of teachers, but schools have a limited fixed budget. So there's been lots and lots of arguments and where when I was in government about whether we should deregulate teacher pay or whether we should stick to national paying missions. At the moment, in common with most things, we have, we have a dual system. So if you're an academy or a multi-academy trust, you can set your pay or whatever you want. Uh, if you're in a local authority maintained school, it's, it's, there's a bit of flexibility, but it's slightly more difficult. But effectively, almost everybody tracks the national paying conditions because everyone is funded the same and teachers earn about the same. So, you know, unless you can do something really, really whizzy, it's quite hard for you to, to fundamentally remodel your workforce because you need a certain number of people in a classroom. You need to pay them a certain amount of money, otherwise they won't leave their existing school. You've got to pay your pension costs. Suddenly, you know, your budget is spent the same as anyone else's. So um, I, I am I am of the view that what we're starting to see happen in some of the biggest maths is a bit of flexibility around pay uh, and for example united learning make it a really big 
point of differentiator that they have a salary scale that's significantly above the national scale, which they manage to fund because they're more efficient. Uh, I know there are lots of other maps that are trialing different ways of, of, of doing recruitment and retention packages. I'm all in favor in general of these things being deregulated down to school or trust level, but fundamentally it's a public sector workforce. It's paid for by the state. Everyone gets about the same amount of money. I'm not in favor of performance related pay anymore. I used to be. Uh, I, I don't think it is fundamentally ever really going to shift from the way it operates. Okay. Um, Sam, what do you think about the sort of balance of spending between the different age groups? Because, I, I mean, I think it's it's quite shocking in a way how it drops off at 16 and that sort of shortfall, if you like, in the 16 to 19 age bracket. And obviously schools, to some extent, cross-subsidise, don't they? But that's much harder for sixth form colleges and FE colleges. What's your um view about the kind of balance between the different parts of the system yeah and the fact that post 16 it has been sort of hammered so hard over the last decade as luke showed in, in his slides at the beginning is purely political um and it is purely the fact that um the government wished to say that they had maintained school funding at the same level in 2010 and the treasury decided that post 16 didn't count as school and therefore could be kept out of that and therefore could take a cut when schools couldn't so it took more of the cut um it, it's just the, the exact kind of nonsense that goes on in spending reviews that has then massive ramifications down the line i think post 16 is now is now seriously underfunded and dangerously so to the point where we have a very impoverished curriculum uh, or, or in many schools, there's in, in FE colleges, there's an impoverished curriculum with essentially the focus being on um, a, a fairly short amount of time that's given to the to the funded course with little wrapped around it. I know different in arc schools, um, but 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 in a lot of in a lot of uh, institutions, it's not. Um, uh, so you know, like like we were talking about with, earlier with qualifications reform, I think you know within the sector funding. Uh, change has to happen you know for you you're going to prioritize anything it would be post-16 education which has had uh, an unsustainable an unsustainable cut it's also interesting the points we've made that um primary has sort of uh increased so much more than secondary relatively over over quite a long period now and the fact that primary schools are almost now as well funded as secondary schools i don't, I don't think that's ever that, 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 that's it's happened so slowly that no one's ever really talked about it but it is quite a big policy change um and I don't think we've there's been any good research that I've seen on whether on, on whether that balance is right and whether actually we need to readjust again and, and, and put more into secondary or whether it's it's been the right thing to do. But it, it, it's just interesting that it, until Luke mentioned it, you know, when I saw his report, I just hadn't even noticed it happening. I don't think man, many policymakers have. OK, there's a question here from Stuart Locke. Um, I agree with Jonathan about schools and trusts having to pay broadly the same. Do government have any way through shifting conditions or time uh, to facilitate a longer school day, which seems a policy objective that the department appears to come keep coming back to? Whether it's desirable or not, it feels like they'll come up against similar issues. Um, Luke, do you want to address that? I, I went to Stuart School, Bedford Free School, and it's absolutely brilliant the way in which um, they have a longer day, but it's used not only for academic, there's a sort of fully integrated uh elective scheme with sport drama music and it just allows time for non-academic subjects as well so it's a much sort of broader um education do you look and there's obviously the evidence on time is is um complicated but do you think there's a way in which it could be done uh Stuart will correct me but i think um they don't actually they do it within the existing budgets do you think there's a way in which schools could um uh, adjust their distribution of the budget to allow for a longer day? Well, I, I think um, the extent to which you can do it within existing budgets will depend on the said budget of school and the and the goodwill of staff to um, do mm -hmm. um, do extra things at, at, outside, outside of the normal working hours. So the extent to which school can get rid of activities or time or, or things that teachers don't really need to be doing and can be doing these things more, I suspect that that, that could help. But Fundamentally, it's it's down to issues of hard cash, staff, um, and time. Um, so uh, the the evidence on school time is is I well I, I think I've said it on a number of occasions in, in numerous forums that I I don't think the evidence is weak 
the evidence is quite strong, but it's the extent to which we could get policy to, to reflect that. School time, extra time in school will be effective it's, if it's well funded and if it's effectively part of the normal school day. And um, so that basically every child attends either because it's compulsory or compulsory. Um, where it's sort of an adjunct to the school, a sort of optional run by other people who aren't really connected, doing some other WYSI education idea that's a little bit of a, of a tryout, it's never going to work. And those are the cases that Treasury probably focused on and thought, well, this might happen. But in the extent mm -hmm. that that's basically saying we don't really have confidence in the Department for Education to do this properly, um, which maybe, maybe, maybe is the right assumption, but it's, it's doing it properly. It's about spending mm -hmm. money, getting the extra staff um, and being able to rely on teachers' goodwill to do that sort of thing. Jonathan, do you think there's a sort of, um, are there efficiencies in the system that could allow uh, a better use of the money that exists? So, um, you know, for example, Stuart puts in the chat that they get rid of some of the nonsense. Is there too much marking? Is there too much paperwork, too, many, too much data management, data collection? Uh, too much kind of um, red tape or uh, other inefficiencies in the system? And, or, and also, could you use technology to liberate teachers to some extent and to personalise learning? So is there a reform, reform way out of this? Well, Quite briefly, we, know that schools, we, know that schools, we know that schools do spend money in different ways. Uh, and there's been various research reports which show that schools allocate budgets in different ways and spend money in different ways. And there's various different reports which show the efficiency of spend, if you're going to be cruelly economic about it, the efficiency of spend varies significantly across schools. And one of the things that Treasury and the Department for Education have a regular argument about is about that level of inefficiency of spend. Um, and, you know, we see at the moment some schools and trusts who are significantly in deficit and regularly in deficit. And we see some schools and trusts who are regularly in surplus, who are have been effectively funded the same. It's not quite because of the crazy funding system we have, but, but, but more or less funded the same and are able to operate significantly in surplus. And indeed, uh, there was a piece in, in Schools Week the other week that showed that some of the biggest mats have accrued, you know, very, very significant surpluses now. I think that's a positive. I think we should be able to deliver efficiency throughout the system and we should then allow trusts and schools to use that surplus in the way they think best, whether it's paying for longer hours or technology. Interestingly, the department and indeed also the treasury tend to look a bit askance at that. They don't like schools and trusts holding surpluses. Their argument is that if you've done so, you're not spending it on the schools and the children for which parliament has given you the money. So you do get this weird situation sometimes in which the DfE is simultaneously castigating schools for running deficits, but also castigating them for running surpluses. In other words, unless you manage to run a multi-million pound budget and hit it pretty much bang on the nose, you are in danger of being caught up by somebody. Now, that just seems to me crazy. Um, is there a technological solution to this? Possibly, although I'm very, very sceptical about a lot of the technology that exists and the ability to make it do anything that is actually useful for children and teachers to reduce workload. I think it is very possible. But it seems to me that one of the best things we have done over the last 10, 15 years is deregulate funding down and significantly skill up head teachers and bring in professional business managers and finance experts around them such that they can manage this money expertly. When I was in government uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was a tough job for most head teachers to run a multi-million pound budget. Now it is very, very rare to see a secondary school. Uh, you get some in primary, very rare to secondary school and non-existent at trust level to not have finance professionals running this stuff. That's absolutely how it should be. And that's the best way of freeing up this money to make it easier for teachers to teach. OK, I think that's a good note to end on. So thank you very much to all of the panellists. Thank you to uh, the audience for joining this session. Uh, and the next ARC talk is on the 23rd of February at 5pm. And as Sam mentioned, the subject is what is the future of technical and vocational education? And the link to register is in the chat now. Thank you so much uh, and have a good evening. <laughs>